All right, folks, why don't we just get this thing going, if we may. Um, I know everybody's still eating. The potato chips are very loud. Don't worry about it. Um, I'm sorry about the, the tight quarters, um, but there seems to be some kind of interest in this issue. And um, it's, a, it's a small room, but it's, it's very centrally located between the House and Senate. So we're very happy about that. Um, uh, my name is Tim Lorden. I'm with the Internet Caucus Advisory Committee, and we do, um, for the past decade, we've been doing event programming for the Congressional Internet Caucus on relevant issues. Um, it's been 10 years since our first uh, panel uh, briefing like this on broadband, which was back in uh, 1997. The Internet Caucus had its first discussion of broadband deployment. Um, so we've been uh, looking at this issue for, for a while now, um, and uh, since then, a lot has happened. Um, in January, what we do is the advisory committee is consists of um, corporations, trade associations, um, public interest groups, nonprofits, um, uh, consumer groups, and we get together as a group to kind of plan what the relevant uh, topics are for discussion for that Congress really needs to be looking at. Um, you obviously didn't need us to tell you that net neutrality is an important one. But nevertheless, we got together as a group and kind of planned a four-person panel and what, what the relevant perspectives would be for the, for the panel. It was funny that uh, half of the membership came at it from a perspective of um, just recently, there were two um, regulatory and legal decisions that they felt had removed some certain principles um, governing access to the Internet that they thought should be preserved. Uh, the other half of the group felt that there were some bills starting to percolate in Congress that would ins uh, uh, bolt on or map on um, significant regulation um, to, to the Internet that hadn't existed before. So um, the groups came at it from different perspectives. Um, and, and what we decided to do was um, uh, not make any judgments about which, which perspective was correct, and, but to have a discussion about that. Um, last year, uh, let's how this issue came to the fore for us last year. About in March of last year, um, we had the briefing on VIP port blocking, and it was just about a month after uh, the Federal Communications Commission had settled a um, a problem with a uh, phone company in, in rural, I guess it was North Carolina, I, I might think it was, uh, called Madison River, where they were blocking the ports of a, a VIP phone service that operated over the internet. The FCC stepped in very quickly. A, a five-page consent order, and um, for 30 months that problem is solved. We had a discussion about that just shortly thereafter, um, but in that time, uh, many bills have been introduced. I think as we uh, stand here today, we have about over, over half, half a dozen bills, probably more if you really wanted to expand your definition. Um, just a few of them are, um, we have the Barton Rush Bill in the House Commerce Committee. Um, I think that's called COPE, is that right? The COPE Bill? Um, we have the Markey bill, or the would-be Markey amendment to that COPE bill, um, which is actually, I think it's um, uh, H.R. 5273. We had the House Judiciary Committee's bill by Sensenbrenner, Conyers, and even uh, Congressman ba uh, Bauscher, who is our caucus co-chair um, for the Internet Caucus, who just got married, by the way, this week, if anybody didn't hear that. Congressman Bauscher got married. Congratulations. Um, and... Um, we also have Senator Stevens has a bill um, in, the, in the Senate Commerce Committee. Uh, Senator, Senator Snow and Dorgan have their own Senate Commerce Committee bill, as does Senator Ensign and another bill by Senator Wyden. So there's quite a, a bit of legislation out there. And, and also, um, as you may notice, the, the title of this panel is Legislating Net Neutra Net Neutra Network Neutrality uh, Necessary? Question mark. And, and a very real option here is, uh, is it not is this legislation not needed at all? Um, is there is there uh, is there not a problem? Is or is if there are problems down the road like there was with Madison River, do, is there existing legal um, common law statutory authority sufficient to address it? Um, so uh, that's that's kind of my 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 opening. Um, I think the question is what's at stake. Um, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to wax poetic because we really don't have the time. Um, but. Senator Allen said in the hearing, and he said it actually quite a few times, that um, the Internet is one of the most Im important developments or phenomena since the invention of the Gutenberg Press. Um, Lee Rainey at the Pew Internet and American Life Project um, likes to tell a story about a book he's, he's read detailing the 200 years after the development of the Gutenberg Press. Apparently, um, what was the ma vast majority of stuff that was printed in the, 200, the two centuries 
after the Gutenberg press were like black magic and hocus pocus spells. Um, it really didn't, there was nothing any substantive that came out of the Gutenberg press for years with the exception of the Bible, which is a big one, no, no question. Um, but uh, generally everything else was all black magic and hocus pocus. The internet it's in the past 20 years and even in the last 10 years that we've even been having broadband to the home um, has, has transmogrified every um, aspect of commerce, of communications, it is quite possibly the greatest tool for free speech ever developed. So there is a lot at stake, no matter which way you come at this, this, um, um, this, this discussion. The format for today, we have four expert panelists. Um, I think you probably all should know them. Um, if you don't, their email addresses are in the, um, the, the little folder that we have, so feel free to email them and get to know them. Um, they're all experts on this issue. What we'll do is I'll start off with asking them some moderated questions. We're not going to have any like opening statements or anything like that. We're just going to have uh, moderated questions at the beginning. Very quickly, I'll open up to questions from you um, because I think it's more important what you think and the questions that you have rather than the, the questions that I have. And, and people have given me, been giving me questions for the past week that I'd be happy to ask. But um, be prepared for questions. When you do ask a question, I'm just going to repeat it into the microphone, um, not to be redundant, but just because it'll be webcast and podcast after the event, as we do with all of our events. Um, so I think um, just one last piece of housekeeping. We passed out one pagers. Everybody should have gotten them. What we did, we solicited from our entire membership of the Internet Caucus Advisory Committee, 200 organizations, to send us one pagers on this issue, on this very question. So we got, we got about over a dozen of really good ones. Uh, maybe even close to two dozen, really good one-pagers that might help you as you kind of parse through this issue and see where everybody is. Um, and then we also um, have uh, given you a list of our upcoming events throughout the summer. Um, it's not an exhaustive list, but it'll give you a preview of what's coming up. So um, let me introduce the panelists in, in turn, uh, uh, in no particular order. Gigi Sohn uh, from Public Knowledge, which is a public interest group here in Washington. We're focusing on a lot of different issues, including intellectual property, but also now um, uh, net neutrality. Uh, Greg Rothschild, Vice President from uh, uh, Verizon Communications. Um, I, I think everybody actually should, uh, may have been aware of um, uh, uh, Greg when he worked on the House uh, just, just until recently. Um, Chris Libertelli. Uh, formerly of the Federal Communications Commission, now with Skype. Um, Chris worked for um, uh, Chairman Powell and, and I think wrote the, uh, um, the Powell Libertelli for Freedoms um, back in the day. And, and of course, uh, not last but not least, um, Mike Schuler, uh, Deputy General Counsel for the National Cable and Telecommunications Association. So um, I guess I'm just going to start off with questions, if I may, if, if that's fine, rather than just going into statements. Um, and I, I, think, I think the question that I've been reading, uh, a lot of people have asked me is, um, I've mentioned Madison River, uh, which happened in about February, well, it didn't happen in February of last year, but it got addressed in February of last year. Um, we, where, where are the examples of, of bad behavior? What are the bad behavior that we're concerned about now um, and possibly in the future? And, and let me take um, uh, one pagers, just because it's an alphabetical order. AT&T is the first one. Um, they start off uh, in the, the, the first page on their one pager with a quote from their chairman uh, uh, saying, you know, we're just not going to block uh, packets or anything like that. And I think the question here today is, is it blocking? Uh, discrimination, prioritization, that's, a, that's, a, that's an important question that we're talking about with regard to net neutrality. And I guess the question is, what's the, what's the bad behavior uh, that we're really, really concerned about here? Um, I see Gigi raising her hand, so. The bad behavior we're concerned about here is discrimination. I mean, plain and simple. What we don't want the telephone companies and the cable companies to do because they own 98% of the broadband pipes in the home of this country, is to favor certain content applications and services in which they have a financial interest. Now, clearly, we are concerned about blocking. But you know, the fact of the matter is, and, and that's the easy one, right? You know, the Madison River case is, is the easy case. The, all the companies pledge they'll never do it again. Uh, so obviously you're concerned about blocking, but you know that's not that's not going to be the scenario. That's going to be the easiest scenario to catch, and the one that you know everybody's going to go crazy over. Which is harder to catch, and, and really more troublesome, is the case where perhaps you know your Vonage service is slowed up a bit because a telephone company or a cable company has its own voice over internet protocol service that they would like to favor. And would that be degrading? Uh, that, would that be a degradation? Absolutely, absolutely. Right. Okay. You, particularly if you're doing it, 
you know, for competitive reasons. But, but I want to get to the, the nub of the argument that this is a solution in search of a problem. I think part of the problem is that we're not defining the word problem correctly. The concern we have is that, again, for the vast majority of homes in this country, you have a choice only between a telephone company or a cable company for your broadband access. And that necessitates some sort of protection against anti-competitive conduct in the form of discrimination. Have there been a boatload of instances of blocking degradation, so on and so forth? No. There have been a handful over the last three, four years. Why is that the case? Well, one of the reasons is, is that up until very recently, there's been a law prohibiting that. And since that time, the companies have been on their best behavior because there's been this pressure from the online companies and from groups like us to behave well, lest you get legislated. Well, Gigi, let me let me get back to the um, I don't want to no. Let me get back to the. I think the question that you raised was uh, until last summer. I want to address that in a few minutes. But Mike is uh, Mike is, is squirming uh, in, in, with regard to. Uh, well, well, I'm squirming with the, I'm squirming with this, with the thought that up until recently there was a law prohibiting uh, prohibiting cable operators from doing what you just said they were doing. There's been no law prohibiting. There's been no network neutrality regulation of cable in the, in the provision of Internet service, nor have there been any identifiable uh, problems of the sort that, that Gigi is mentioning in terms of discrimination. Well, let, let's go into detail on this. Um, uh, last week at, a Senate, at the Senate Commerce Committee hearing, um, there was a panelist that kept reiterating the, the mantra that, or, or the line, that until last summer the Internet had been regulated, and, and I presumably with some type of um, uh, non-discrimination non rules. And I, I guess Let's try to flesh that out, because I, I think there's a lot of different ways to explain that. Um, Chris, can you explain maybe what that, is that true, is it not true, or is it like sort of true? Um, base, the answer is that basic duties of non-discrimination have existed in communications law since 1934. There was a Supreme Court decision last year, the Brand X decision, that removed that basic non-discrimination guarantee. That decision took cable services like the ones that Mike was referring to out of any regime that would impose a non-discrimination duty on cable operators. So, you know, he's right in some very narrow sense that there was no FCC rule that said, if you are a cable operator, thou shalt not block. So sort of, it's sort of true. So there's a little, there's a little okay. ambiguity there, but, but Gigi's point is, remains true, is that that basic tenet of non-discrimination has been a bipartisan part of, of telecom policy for the last 70 years. And that's what we're asking to be reinstated. That reinstated, that's what we are asking to be restored in a post-Brand X world. But can I just clarify one thing? We're not talking about regulating the Internet, okay? The applications, services, and content that make up the Internet has not been regulated. We're not asking for regulation of that. We're asking for regulation of the on-ramps and off-ramps to the Internet. So the transmission um, component from, from the exactly. Internet to the home. And it's been that way, as Chris said, for 70 okay. years. Now, Greg's, Greg? Sure. Um, I, I would argue that, that Michael is actually right in a very broad sense. Um, Non-discrimination provisions have applied to um, the provision of telecommunication services, essentially the by the monopoly provider since 1934. And we've always regulated monopolies. Uh, with non-discrimination provisions, whether it was the, the only gas line to the home or the only electric line to the home or the only freight train that might have gone to South Dakota to carry a farmer's goods to market. We've always regulated monopolies with non-discrimination provisions. But to say that the Internet, the Internet backbone, those people who provided Internet access have always been operating under non-discrimination provisions just isn't true. Uh, the Internet backbone um, is thousands of networks that exchange traffic. And they exchange traffic on a contractual basis, peering agreements. Uh, transit agreements. Those are not regulated through non-discriminatory. Okay, well, let's get, let's get uh, to, just sorry. Cable. Uh, cable has, since 1996, when it started building out broadband, never had non-discriminatory obligations placed upon it. And there's never been a problem. Um, the wireless carriers, the, the wireless cards, the Sprint card, the Verizon wireless card that you see in the marketplace today, those have never had non-discriminatory obligations placed upon them. The Wi-Fi hotspots you go to. And the type of net neutrality we're talking about today would take non-discriminatory obligations straight out of the 1934 Act that regulated monopoly, the telephone monopoly, and it would place it on all of that. 
as I, as I mentioned earlier uh, in my opening, that our membership came at this issue from two perspectives. One was that there something happened um, over the course of the last year that um, deregulated um, something that had been regulated before. Um, which infused that kind of transmission layer from the internet to the home with some kind of non-discrimination non principle. Um, the other half came at it from the perspective that there are bills in Congress that would bolt on uh, legislation regulation that hadn't been there before. Um, and to, to Greg's point about that fiber maybe had never been under any regulatory regime before this. Um, and, and I guess um, my question, that what I, what my question is, what happened last summer? Um, it, it, Brand X. What is Brand X? And um, by the way, um, for my benefit, if people can explain, like Title II, if you could explain what that is, because I, I don't, just assume I don't know what you're talking about. So um, uh, Brand X was a Supreme Court decision last year, and it applied to cable modem service. Yep. And then also there was an FCC DSL order right. um, that also happened last year. And then how, how does that set the stage for where we are today? So um, when I was at the agency, we worked on this Brand X decision and litigated it all the way to the Supreme Court. And it has to do with what box you put cable broadband services into, right? In the past, uh, there was some uncertainty about where broadband existed in the statute. In the Supreme Court's decision, it said squarely that when a cable operator provides access to the Internet, that's not going to be what's known as a Title II service. A Title II service, you can understand that as being a traditional telecom service that comes with it some level of regulation. The Supreme Court said, you're not in that box, you're in this Internet access box, this less regulated box, okay? Now, after that, in August of last year, the Commission harmonized the regime that applied to cable operators, and it said to companies like Greg's, you know what, we're going to try to create a level playing field, and we're going to remove something called the Computer 2 rules, which you should understand those to be the basic guarantee of openness on the Internet, of non-discrimination. And the Commission said, to harmonize the treatment of these two companies, the cable operators and the wannabe cable operators, like Verizon, um, we're going to remove the non-discrimination obligation across the entire network. That is what has led us to today. Well, let and what me... we are asking for is the restoration of that basic safeguard so that consumers can go where they want to on the Internet and continue to receive things like free phone service. Let me get Michael's um, comments on, on that, then we'll go to Greg. Let me take a step back. It seems like ancient history now because the Internet moves so fast, but just maybe 10 years ago or so when we were in a dial-up world, because this is what, uh, what the proponents of net neutrality say, is that the Internet was always, was always subject to, or ISPs were always subject to this kind of common carrier reg net neutrality regulation. In those days, the role of the, of the telephone company as a common carrier was to, was to dial up to make a call to the ISP. But, there were, but the ISPs, the people who were the on-ramps to the Internet at that point, were not regulated as, uh, under net neutrality rules. In a world, when this all started, there was AOL and, and Prodigy. Remember Prodigy? And these were the ways, first of all, they created their own sort of internal dial-up networks that were that provided services in a sort of walled garden sort of way if you if you subscribe to AOL you got maybe the New York Times through there uh, the next thing you know there was the, the the internet the World Wide Web and each one of those services figured out that consumers wanted to get the whole range of services out there on the internet so they began providing service to directly to the internet you could dial up AOL you could dial up Prodigy you could dial up Earthlink, and the next thing you know, you get the internet, and no regulation, no no requirement that everything be available, that there be no blocking. It evolved that way. The idea that this was a world that was previously regulated, where the on ramps to the internet were regulated, simply is not true. But well, here's, in that, in that but here's a difference. Okay, the difference is in the in the ISPs. Was was ten years ago? There were hundreds of them. Okay, thousands of them. Now there's only a handful. I mean, there was competition. And, and that's the other point. Non-discrimination point is the one thing to keep in mind. The other thing to keep in mind is the la utter lack of competition in the broadband field. And do not have anybody tell you, well, satellite's a competitor. They barely get up to broadband speeds. And I would recommend to staffers that they read the GA GAO broadband report. To the extent that there's broadband over power lines in 1% of the country. Now, you can say all you want there is competition in the, in the last mile broadband service, but it's just not true. And the FCC and the GAO have found it. I've not seen any reliable source that shows otherwise. Greg? 
Yeah, I think this debate in some ways have kind of an Alice in Wonderland feel to it. Um, when you look at what's actually going in the marketplace, which kind of gets to Tim's original question, what is the problem? There have been four hearings so far in the Senate and the House. The, all the advocates for net neutrality, who interestingly have bigger market caps than the Bells and the cable companies combined. I don't. Except for, <laughs> except for GG. <laughs> Fair point. Yet. But the other folks. Um, yet. Never. <laughs> They had plenty of opportunity to, to really to come and talk about what the problem is. I mean, normally when we regulate, whether it's clean air or clean water or highway safety, and I, I was up here for nine years on, on the Commerce Committee in the House and the Senate, we had lots of hearings about regulation. And normally the prerequisite for regulating, for, for, for getting out there and actually enacting new regulation, which is what the net neutrality folks are seeking, is a problem. It's some kind of evidence of a problem. Dirty air, dirty water, accidents on the highways. So you talk about what the problem is, you identify it, and you try to solve it with regulation that actually is aimed at that problem. Now, that's been completely absent from this debate. Now, whether you want to call the market competitive or not competitive, or duopoly or a competitive market, or whether you want to include the, the Sprint and the Verizon wireless cards as com competition or not, the actual facts are that since these decisions have taken place, since cable was deregulated in 1996, cable broadband modem penetration has exploded. Prices have come down and speeds have gone up. Since Verizon was deregulated in that 03 decision, which GG vilifies, well, we finally started putting fiber into the ground. And now we are offering consumer, consumers broadband access of 5 megabits, 15 megabits, and 30 megabits downstream. We never did that previously. Had, had you had fiber, let, and let's, whether or not you would under a regulatory, our, our, had, you had, had you started laying fiber before that decision, um, would that fiber be regulated under those rules? I'm, I'm not aware, but I will tell you that well, the rules would have changed. Rules would have deregulated fiber but, bills. But would they have been regulated before that? Well, I guess the point is Had that you dropped in fiber on the up ground? In, up until then, we competed with cable with a copper technology called DSL, which puts electronics at both ends and in the central office and in the home, and that's how we competed with cable modem service. Since that decision, when those monopoly regulations from 1934 were lifted because the FCC said we are witnessing so much more competition in the marketplace, our prices have gone down and our speeds have gone up. And by the way, Pew, Pew, um, the Pew Group, which, uh, just came, which we have not any affiliation with that I'm aware of, just came out with a report that said that broadband penetration is up 40 percent since that 2003 decision. So you can call this market, you know, Gigi can call it uh, duopoly, I'll call it competitive. But either way, consumers have benefited. Well, let me, let me shift gears on, because uh, we've been talking about uh, monopoly, uh, market power, and actually all riddled all throughout the different one page that you'll, you'll read, uh, which you'll probably all read tonight. Um, there is a lot of discussion about market power. Market power keeps popping up. And as I mentioned, the Sense and Brenner Conyers uh, Boucher Bill um, ha it addre it addresses the net neutrality issue um, within the Judiciary Committee by taking the Clayton Act, which is an antitrust um, uh, part of the law that says thou shalt not be anti-competitive and it says if you essentially if you have market power um, then you you cannot um, do anything to harm uh, consumer choice and that's I, believe me I'm not an antitrust lawyer but market power as I understand it is defined by in, in short it's huge long case law and big long um, analysis and I'm gonna really simplify it here by saying what the Supreme Court said was the ability for uh, a firm to raise prices um, and if there is competition they just don't have that power to raise prices and I've just as a DSL customer um, my prices for DSL have been going down um, so how, do, how does the mark you say there's a du duopoly you said, I think you mentioned that the FCC report said that 97% of consumers have um, a choice of uh, cable or DSL. But if my prices are going down, I'm assuming that they can't raise those prices and it's a competitive marketplace. So how does, how does Conyers, um, uh, Sensenbrenner work in that regard when prices are indeed going down? But if you start to charge the providers for some sort of, you know, high speed tier access, who are they going to pass the costs on to? Okay. And that's what's going to happen. So it's not, not consumer costs. The... Oh, so it's not consumer costs. It's not, it's... I don't know why it, A, has to be limited to the consumer costs, but ultimately it will pass on to the consumers. The answer is that prices generally don't go down unless you're facing competition. Um, that's what forces you to lower prices. Uh, companies don't take out full-page ads in the Washington Post to get subscribers if they have enormous market power. 
um, they get that because they need to lower prices in order to get those subscribers because they're facing competition. I mean, that's, also that's in the big way of urban market areas, goes. Tim. I mean, you know, let's not let's not talk about Washington. Let's not talk about San Francisco. Fair enough. Let's Fair talk enough. about Besides Omaha, Nebraska. We had um, I'm sh Cox and Cox. You, why don't you? That's, you have a better. You have a good story there. No, I, no. It, well, but have we been hearing reports that in in Omaha that prices have gone to the uh, cable DSL, cable or DSL price? And we have we heard reports of that? Well, let's let's take a step back and. When, you just keep we, wanting to go back, don't well, you? I thought you were moving forward. Yeah, when, we say, <laughs> when you say prices go up or prices go down, really, that's a, that's a simplified way of, of talking about the, the market power in sure. a market where people are selling widgets that don't change over time. Really what you're talking about is, is there a competitive response? Sometimes prices go down as a result of competition. Sometimes competition takes the form of service competition, of, of constantly trying to capture market share by enhancing the product. In fact, in a market like we've, like we've got now, uh, enhancing the product of an evolution, of an evolving product like the Internet is something that is capturing market share. It is the better way to, it is probably the better way to compete. But if you think that, there, that because there are two providers uh, in a community, some, my, my members and some Greg's uh, company, that we're just sitting back and, and kind of dividing the market up between ourselves and not competing, you're not paying attention to what's going on out there. This is cutthroat competition because we're, we're evolving, trying to provide, each company trying to provide what's now being referred to as the triple play or yeah. the quadruple play of internet, voice, video, and data, and, trying, and market share for a capital intensive business like ours is very important. So we're trying to capture Chris, additional subscribers. Um, let me just say, d does Verizon, does Comcast, cable companies, do they, AT&T, do they, do they have market power? Yes, and Gigi is right, and Gigi pointed you as staff to the right numbers to look to. Yes, there's a duopoly in place in the broadband market. And as much as we'd like to pretend that there is this coming competitive landscape, it's just not here yet. The best evidence of this market power is what the CEOs of the major telcos have told you. And to their credit, they have announced their plans. And they have told each and every one of you that they are trying to impose discriminatory charges on website operators. Right? This is not a world that the Internet has known to date. This is a radical change in the business models that have led to an open Internet. And what they've said is, we need to burn the Internet to save it. We need to impose these charges on websites so we can deploy broadband. And I guess I would ask for some critical thinking on this point. I spent three years at the FCC, and contrary to what Greg was suggesting, there was a stream of arguments that if they got this regulatory relief, if they got this regulatory relief, if they got that regulatory relief, they would deploy. This is just another example of them holding hostage the notion of broadband deployment to regulatory relief. All we're really asking for is a minimal safeguard, a minimal safeguard to protect users who want to go where they want to on the Internet. Uh, Michael? That minimal safeguard, which took the form of, of Title II common carrier regulation for years in the, telephone, in, the, in the telephone world, was not exactly minimal. And that's not what we're arguing for here. For we're arguing for the following language, that a network operator shall not discriminate on the basis of ownership or source on the Internet. But it's Greg, as simple as that. Greg? Sure, when we're talking about discrimination here, that, that's not a new word in telecom. I mean, first of all, let's be clear. Thanks for admitting that. It's not. It is. It is. It is well, what I mean by that is, first of all, it's not the insidious discrimination when we talk about discrimination. It's not, we're not talking about race or religion or creed or color or anything like that. But that's all covered by the civil rights laws. Discrimination is about... It, 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 is, it is embedded in Section 202A of the Communications Act. And all I mean by that is, in 1934, when Congress started regulating communications or telephone communications, it saw a monopoly. The only way you could get from point A to point B over a wire was over the telephone wire. So they imposed non-discriminatory obligations on the telephone wire. That is the core. And that, that word is 70 years of precedent going back to then. That is the core of what the net neutrality folks want to now place on all broadband providers. GG. All of them. And that, that, is, that is what's... The, now, if you want minimal regulation, there are minimal regulations out there, and we can have an honest discussion about how to protect consumers to make sure that you get to every website or that you can run any application, that you can attach any device. Actually, Go ahead, Gigi? Sorry. sorry, Greg, I don't want to interrupt you. I, actually, the, the term non-discriminatory or non-discrimination appears in the Communications Act 72 times. So 71 times more than Greg. So it doesn't have one meaning, okay? Although it, it isn't, I'm, I'm happy to hear Greg admit that it isn't a complicated concept because some of his bosses have told me otherwise. 
Let me tell you about a, a regulation that prohibits non-discrimination that Verizon really likes to use. It's called the Program Access Rules. It's Section 628 of the Communications Act. And it prohibits cable operators from discriminating in price terms and conditions in, in, in making available the programming they own. So they have to make it available to satellite providers, to folks like Verizon who now have the new Fios cable system. They have to provide on non-discriminatory price terms and conditions. The regulations for, um, for program access, once you get past the definitions, are about four pages long in the, in the Code of Federal Regulation. And Verizon now has filed two program access complaints, one against Comcast and one against Rainbow Media Holdings, because they think that non-discrimination is perfectly fine in the provision of, uh, of cable programming. So I find it kind of curious that in some situations, non-discrimination is fine, but in other situations, it's not fine. Well, did I also, you, just it, one it, other it, thing. The program access rules have been around for 15 years. They've been, there've only been several dozen complaints filed. It's a complaint process, much like the one we want here, and it's largely been self-effectuating. So well, again, the notion is to be heavy, heavy duty regulation with, you know, huge government oversight. It's just not the case. Well, you know, let me ask you. Let, let, me, let me try to. Sure, you. sure. I don't want you to be curious. I've known you for a long time. <laughs> Um, the program access rule is actually a great way for I would love to I would love Congress to approach this debate the way Congress approached the program access rules in the early 90s. I mean, back then you had satellite companies who were trying to get into the cable business and compete, and a lot of the cable networks were owned by those cable companies, and there were hearings and there was evidence of a problem. And once they saw the problem, Congress grafted a very narrowly tailored solution to a specific problem that had been identified. And, and, that and if you look at and it, and it's Section 628 of the, of the Cable Act, if you look at that, it is riddled with exceptions for legitimate business practices. Now, again, if, if we're, if we're, I would be very happy to see Congress engage in that kind of critical analysis on net neutrality. And if, if Congress identifies a problem along the lines of what anyone is discussing, then let's talk about how to solve that problem. Well, why doesn't the FCC have uh, the FCC uh, apparently has some kind of ancillary authority, as as exhibited in the Madison River case of last year? Um, Chairman Majoris of the Federal Trade Commission has said that um, she, they have the ability to um, uh, you know step in if their uh, consumers are harmed. Um, what, why why does Congress have to do anything? Isn't there existing legal authority um, at the moment, as exhibited in Madison River? And I know GD was right. I mean, that's an easy that's an easy question. It was a matter of just simple blocking of ports of a VIB provider. But in discrimination, as Gigi has described it, um, doesn't the FCC have the, um, the existing legal authority? Doesn't the FTC can step in? Yeah. The, the answer to the FCC question is no. The Commission does not have the existing legal authority to, impo to impose a non-discrimination obligations on network owners. The Madison River case is very interesting. I was around during that time. That was a settlement. There was nothing legal about that case. That case was the FCC saying, hey, we see a problem. We're going to investigate this, and it's settled. And the Barton, the Barton, the Barton bill actually says that the FCC has as a case-by-case -case authority to, to address these issues. Would that, be, um, would that be a step up from the existing authority? Case-by-case -case adjudication is important, and it's something that can be used to protect openness on the Internet. But what you need, and this is something that only Congress can do, is a rule of decision. That's why when you hear Gigi and I talk about non-discrimination, that is the rule of decision that we're asking the agency to enforce case by case. It is possible to come up with a regime that is very lightweight, that it deals only with discriminatory behavior and enforces that right case by case at the agency. And Mike? Well, it sounds like so far you don't need case by case authority, you just need case authority, because there's only one case that's come up in this whole discussion over all the years, I don't know what more that's not what, true. what more threat do you need to an open internet than the exercise of market power by telcos arguing for discriminatory charges on Google, Yahoo, eBay, well, and Microsoft? Well, actually, argument. What other evidence do you need? Argument. What would be best for well, argument? Yes, argument is rarely argument is rarely sufficient evidence to impose a layer of regulation, prophylactic regulation, in an area where you can always. This is not a case. I mean, we heard lots of arguments back in the time of the open access debate that, you know, if we don't impose a rule now that forces, forces access by all kinds of unaffiliated ISPs to the network, they, the networks might get built in a way that forecloses that. So we better do this regulation now or we'll never be able to unscramble the eggs. This is not a case like that. This is a case that says if there's discrimination, there should be a rule against discrimination. And if there's a problem, there's time. We're not opposed to the kind of vigilant restraint 
that the, that the FCC has from the outset thought was the appropriate approach, which is not to say, walk away from this, let's not worry about it, the marketplace will work. It's to say, keep an eye on this. People have identified potential anti-competitive things that people can do, and if the marketplace evolves in a way that these sorts of things begin to happen, then let's see if there's a regulation that's appropriate. But if you put a regulation on in advance, people, people in, people's behavior is inhibited by the, by the possibility Michael, of something. Michael, I think Greg wants to help you out here. I just wanted to, I wanted to pick up on, <clears throat> excuse me, something that Michael said about the open access debate. Um, for those of you, and I see a lot of familiar faces in the room who have been following telecommunications policy for a while now, this is really the continuation of a debate that's been going on for many, many years. Um, in 1996, during the Telecom Act, there were a lot of folks who wanted to pledge more stronger economic regulation on information services. Because if we didn't do that, the marketplace would shut down and you'd have these dominant providers. And, you know, the Democrats and the Republicans, frankly, said no at that time. And then in 1999, what Michael just referred to, the Internet access providers, cable at that time was the, ma the major broadband Internet access provider, not the telcos. And AOL said, we have to have access to that network. And if you don't allow us, guarantee us, legislate access to that network, competition will shut down, deployment penetration will go down. Well, and the Canard FCC. Well, Greg, with, uh, well, with the, I mean, I think, I think, I think, well, I think that that was a that was a debate that was had, and and it, it, well, yeah, it, it panned out. I think we're talking about something different here today. Well, we're talking about we're not we're not talking about something very different. We're talking about networks, the investment made in networks, and we have folks who really want access to that networks, and they want government to regulate the terms and conditions of those access. Absolutely not. This and is about is, this is about consumer access to the network. It's not about our access well, the, to the network. The, that, the bill and, and let me, that's let's, introduced are about the service providers' access and rights to access and services on the network. The legislation. So this is an important point, if we could explore this just a, a little. I mean, what you're going to start hearing over the next few days is that there's this wholesale thing and there's this consumer thing, and that maybe net neutrality is appropriate as a solution to the consumer problem, but don't worry about the providers on the net, the wholesale providers like Google, Yahoo, and Microsoft. And it's just too simple. All of the costs of these networks are ultimately borne by the consumers. Consumers pay all these costs. No matter if Greg's company imposes a charge on Google or Yahoo, those costs will all get passed to the end user. And what we're saying is the best way to build different differentiated products and faster speed networks is allow consumers to choose whether they want more bandwidth or less. So it, by costs all being, you know, uh, put on the consumers, are you saying that, um, as I've heard before, that Google and Skype and others are getting a free lunch? No, because, look, does, does all Google that, pay, does Google, Google Skype, do they pay for the network? On the net, right? And what, why do they pay on the net? What, well, they what, pay because they offer big, they provide big server farms that need to get their traffic onto the internet. And they pay companies that are network owners lots of millions of dollars a year to get their traffic on the net. And the beauty of the internet is that consumers pay to pull that down. You don't pay to land your traffic, consumers pay to pull it down from the net. We're trying to preserve that system, that of transparent bandwidth markets. And in fact, in another context, the telcos have been very, very progressive in their advocacy about pushing charges to the edge in the circuit switch world. And what we're saying is don't recreate that bad regulation in the internet. Leave consumers in control of what bandwidth they subscribe to. Greg and then Mike. Sure, consumers have control today, and we'll, I guess a lot's been talking about the future, what Verizon's plans are for the future. So let me just, from what, let me tell you what I know about our plans for the future. Um, we are deploying fiber. We are, for the first time, actually doing fiber t straight to the home, which will allow us to do a lot of things. And fr frankly, will allow us to do for, for consumers at the home what we've been able to do for businesses for a long time, which is much more bandwidth and a lot of other features like security and reliability and enhanced connectivity and things like that. Those are things that consumers want. We want to do that. So we're always going to give consumers a choice between levels of Internet access. That's not going to stop. In addition to the 5 megabits or the 15 megabits or the 30 megabits, we want to be able to provide service providers like content providers with enhanced security. Or we want to provide healthcare providers with enhanced connectivity or security or financial institutions or whatever it is on top of the Internet access that we provide to consumers. Okay. And that market hasn't even gelled yet. What we're saying is let us develop that market. Let us reach those commercial And, and I, think, I think, Greg, you're talking about your three laser thing, right? Uh, and I don't mean to be flip. Uh, you have three lasers which are fiber to the home when it comes to your advanced services. So you have one laser for video, right? And you're going to IPTV, presumably we'll go over that. Our, the way we're one laser for access to the kind of public. We have, we have a light. We have a, a beam of light that essentially goes through the fiber and, and pulses um, literally billions of times a second. 
that carries the video stream or carries the internet access, another one for the internet access stream, another one for other streams. And we want to be able to really develop products and services with that, with that capacity. But as Tom Talk, you said at, at detail, but, and then I've heard you know, Mike McKeon and, and, and Link um, say at detail, you have three different lasers, and each has almost unlimited capacity you know, to a certain extent. Um, one for video for your IPTV service, one for access to the you know, internet, um, and then, then one for VPNs. And VPNs, I guess, are virtual private networks, and they're, they're um, like sheaths of encryption uh, or tunnels, essentially, to specific services, um, perhaps telemedicine, other, other applications. Why couldn't, if you could narrowly craft a bill to impose network neutrality um, or, or non-discrimination provisions on, like, the middle laser that goes to kind of the general internet and, and leave yourself to experiment with the other two lasers, why wouldn't that be acceptable? First of all, there's, 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 there's no bill I've seen that does that. Okay, but if there um, were a bill. And second of all, I, 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 again, I would, I would ask you, we are in the process right now, and the entire marketplace is in the process of increasing speeds to the home and decreasing prices. Um, and it's this regulatory regime that some folks don't like today has, that has led to this. So I don't want to predict what the regulatory consequences would be, but I would say this to you. No broadband network has ever been constructed other than our copper DSL network, which I don't really wouldn't consider an advanced network, no broadband network has ever been constructed, wireline or wireless or satellite, under the regulatory regime of non-discrimination. So okay, let me let me ask Gigi a, a question yeah. um, with regard to investment in Wall Street. Um, going back, I guess we want to go back several years now um, to the uh, fiber laying of fiber all across the the continent and and across the the world. Uh, market of several years ago. You all remember Global Crossing, all the other, you know, even Teledesic, which was a Craig McCaw satellite thing. Um, lots of investment were poured into um, laying fiber all over the place. Um, and essentially that created kind of a Wall Street investment bubble. Um, and when it realized that the demand just wasn't there for that capacity, um, the whole, the whole um, market tanked and all global, everybody went bankrupt and it was a disaster. It also it was a bit of a WorldCom issue, um, as you may recall. And I guess there's something to be said um, for, for Greg's point is that um, don't they need to have some insurances on investment of building out this the new fiber uh, to the home um, and, and, and won't Wall Street, if there are neutral, neutrality provisions imposed upon that, won't Wall Street again spank these companies and, uh, and, the, and the investment will go out of it? Well, first of all, the investment is happening and it's happening now, it's been happening for years, but we're not saying you can't provide security services. We're not saying you can't provide virtual private networks. We're not saying you can't provide these value-added services. What we're saying is you can't discriminate, and you can't charge extra as a condition of carriage. So, yeah, we are saying there is a very, very narrow business model in which you cannot engage, and that's a discriminatory business model. But beyond that, go and God bless. Make all the money you want. Hey, Mike. Well, this is the, if we're talking about a much narrower net neutrality than some of the bills that we've looked at and some of the policies that are out there, if you, you two guys are talking about a much narrower one, then I have a question, which is that access to the Internet, I mean, most people get to the site that they're going to on the web through Internet Explorer or through Google or through one of the, the search engines. At least as many people use those, that, that small handful of portals to the internet as use the variant the, there, there are more than one cable operator in the country by the way that and more than one telephone company as an ISP that might have affiliated interests would you not have the same concern that the Google's and the and the internet internet explorers of the world <laughs> would also have an incentive to favor and discriminate against getting you to the... I get there's, robust, Gigi, though. there's robust competition in search engines. Just because people like Google and Yahoo a lot and favor them doesn't mean there's well, competition. And, and here's, there's here's my point A9, about there's Firefox. I mean, you can keep going. But here's another point, and Harold Feld from Media Access Project made an excellent made this excellent point at a Senate Commerce Committee uh, briefing the other day, is that the switching cost, what does it cost me to switch from Google to Firefox? Well, well, let me, let me ask you. Let, what let, would let it me cost help me to switch from, Chris. from uh, my bundled cable operator, which I have now, to DSL? A lot. Let me play devil's advocate um, on behalf of, of Michael. Um, yeah, it does seem that there's a lot of competition in the search engine marketplace. Uh, I, I'll, 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 I'll grant you. Um, but in, when it comes to computer chips, there isn't as much competition in computer chips, let's say.
today. Um, there's really only two manufacturers of computer chips in, in, in the world, really. And we, last, last month, a couple months ago, we had the CEO of AMD um, here at the Internet Caucus Speaker Series. And, and they have, they're the other chip manufacturer. And they, they found um, that um, when Skype had rolled out its service, it had um, uh, developed a certain uh, teleconferencing service of 10 or more people could uh, teleconference over the Internet. Um, but you could only do it if you were running this particular high-end Intel super-fast chip. If you were running anything lower, you couldn't. If you ran an AMD chip, you couldn't run it. And in your one pager, Chris, you had said that part of the freedoms or the non-description we're talking about is the ability to connect any device to the internet and have it worked. How does your, uh, a consumer's ability not to have this super-fast um, Intel chip um, using the Skype service connecting to the internet and doesn't work. How does it, how do you square that? So this is what I learned in my three years as a regulator is you know you're on to something when they start changing the subject, right? <laughs> the subject is in net neutrality the market power of network operators. But now here, let's go it, to the applications in, layer. There are certain chips that can't handle 10 person video conferencing well, okay? And we as a company wanted to increase the, we wanted to improve the consumer experience. There was nothing exclusive about it. But they're the saying the same thing. Who's saying the same thing? Um, the, the Verizons, the Comcast, they want to improve the right. consumer experience. The, but the, the point is that what, we, what you have in the network operator space is two companies that are providing network access to upwards of 95% of the country. And what we're saying is that exercise of market power looks causes concern for openness and innovation on the Internet. The fact is... And he'll now draw an analogy between the Intel AMD duopoly and the network operator duopoly. There are other chipsets out there, and that software that you referred to can work on AMD. So th there is openness at the application layer. There is choice at the application layer. Folks can choose to not use Skype if they don't want to make free phone calls and they want to pay. Um, Mike, Mike they Stein, can use Mike Yahoo Messenger. <laughs> uh, Greg? Yeah, I want to get back. I don't want to change the subject, so I want to get back okay. to where we were on search engines. You know, Verizon has a search engine. I, I'm sure most of you don't use it because it's nowhere near as good as Google. In fact, I frankly don't use it. I use Google. But it's called Super Pages. And every day, people over Verizon DSL go to Google and not Super Pages. So it gets back to Gigi's point about discrimination. We have every reason in this world where the, we're the evil network operator, operator in a duopoly to discriminate against Google and drive, uh, and drive traffic to super pages. We compete against Vonage every day. Vonage has several hundred thousand customers on telephone lines, and there's never been a problem with any of the, any of the large telephone companies discriminating against Vonage. Other than Madison River, I don't have any problem with any telephone company. Time Warner, one of, one of Michael's companies, has lots of content online. They provide broadband internet access. Time Warner's never been accused of discriminating in favor of their own content. And despite that not one day of Time Warner's existence has a non-discrimination obligation been upon it. Can I ask Greg a question about that? Um, help us, the audience and me, understand um, what you mean when you say you don't discriminate against VOIP applications in the wireless space. When I bought EVDO service, I bought this card and I got to use it as broadband access to the internet. But when I signed up, the terms of service said I can't use it for VOIP. What's not discriminatory about that? I, I would like, I, I think there was someone on a wireless company who wanted to be on the panel to answer it. That's a technical That's right. question. So I apologize. And if there's someone in the audience who could answer it, I, that, that might be a good thing. Right. I will tell you, well, let me, you asked the question, okay. let me do my best. Um, when I've heard the wireless companies talk about this, they are very spectrum constrained. They don't have fiber. They buy channels. They buy megahertz channels. And they, can, they, they, they really can't expand much of what they have other than compression technology, which they are advancing. And maybe one day you will be able to run VOIP, but I think the management challenges that a wireless operator has are much greater than the, wire, than the management challenges that a cable or, or, or a Verizon operator And we has. would actually agree with you on that. There are unique challenges in the wireless space, but our ask is that if you're going to have network management policies in place, that they be non-discriminatory. So you don't just shut out Skype and allow the VIP client. Well, in, well, well that also, point, Greg, also, Greg just made the case for why wireless is not a third Third line competitor is not a broadband competitor. You just you just described why well, your EVDO contract says no peer to peer. Let, let, no let's take the, let's take wireless. But I think this is one important point I just want to make. Verizon Wireless's broadband card does not allow Verizon's voice wing VoIP service either. We are not discriminating in favor of a Verizon product against Vonage or against Skype. 
there is a blanket non-discriminatory rule against VoIP providers. Well, let me, let me, give, you, let me give another um, wireless scenario, and then I'll, I'll ask, I've been, I've used up a lot of my time, I apologize, and we'll go to cash questions, but um, Craig McCaw, uh, who built AT&T Wireless, McCaw Wireless before it, um, is now rolling out um, a service he's calling Clear, Clearwire. And very clearly, in Clearwire's um, terms of use statement, it says um, you cannot use um, a VOIP service over, it, it's a WiMAX you know, um, service, wireless WiMAX service. You can't use your own VOIP service over it, but rather we'll use our own VOIP service. I think that's what they're saying. And, and the question is, now, Clearwire is not a bell. It's not a cable company. It, it, if, if, if any of these network or pick one that goes into uh, implementation, whether it be Markey, whether it be Sensenbrenner, whether it be Stevens, whether it be Wyden and Snow or Snow Dorgan, forgive me, would that, those net neutrality rules prevent Macaw um, from uh, Craig McCaw and, and Clearwire from from prioritizing their own VIP service over their own wireless service, and if so, absolutely. Okay, and if so, doesn't that kind of thwart um, what we're trying to get at with more competition, more providers? Uh, it's an open question. But the point is We've, that if if they're going to be out there providing a a service and they're going to call it Internet Access Service. It has to do that. It has to provide access to the internet. I don't think he's calling subset. that. I think he's saying, I'm going to build a wireless service. Right, he's saying, I'm going to build a wireless, wireless service, and by the way, you can't use Skype on this. You can't go to that particular part of the internet. Isn't that and a so, marketplace decision to use his service or not? It, it, it is at some level, but we scratch our heads when we get the idea that when there are multiple facilities-based competitors, you'd expect more openness. But when you look at the wireless market, where you do have three or four facilities-based competitors, you see some of the most closed networks ever. You see network operators acting as if the handset is their own private desktop and only allowing affiliated services on that desktop. And that, that, that seems odd to us, and it seems to violate net neutrality norms. Greg? Yeah, I, th I think you've hit on the nut of the argument. Um, another policy goal, or I, I would argue would be the central policy goal of Congress, should be to get more and more broadband networks out there. If the problem is there's not enough competition among broadband networks, I, I would argue there's, there's a lot of competition, but you can always have more. So if the, if, the, if the goal of policy should be to get more broadband networks out there, then just look at the history of telecom regulation. You've never incented, whether you're Democrat or Republican, you, the Congress or the FCC has never successfully gotten more investment by placing greater regulation. That's just in, in, the, in the cable world, in the telco world, in the wireless world, in the satellite world. That has never happened. So this is an enormous leap of faith that we're going to take all these new regulation, we're going to take stuff straight out of the 1934 Act, we're going to put it on every broadband provider invented today, invented tomorrow, the folks who buy at the 700 megahertz auction, the folks who buy at the AWS auction. We're going to tell all of them that you're going to have, you're going to live with these rules that have been in place for decades. That's not, I, I would argue that's just not a good way to get broadband investment into the marketplace. Tim, if I could just address that for a second. I think, we're, again, we're kind of changing the subject, and it's a very important subject. I think none of us would be here if there were four or five competitors in most markets, okay? That's not the case. It's not going to be the case for the, for the distant future. Greg talked about the AWS auction. One great way to get another competitor out there is if you, your company, and his companies would be prohibited from bidding. We don't even know if that spectrum may go to, to go to one of you guys. And then what kind of competition do we have? So I, I think that's at least one way ensuring that the dominant providers can't get access to the means for creating competition might be a great policy to start to jumpstart competition, but it doesn't get away from the fact that right now and for the foreseeable future, and maybe those decades you talk about, we're only going to have two dominant providers. And I, I think Greg's comment really touches on the politics and the policy that's at play in the net neutrality debate. Uh, you know, what, what he describes as a world where you have to incent broadband providers to build deeper fiber networks, more capable fiber networks. And what you're hearing the edge community, the internet community say, is that that's only half of the equation. 
And if you only focus your policy on the incentives of network operators, you have forgotten about our own investment incentives because what we need is a stable playing field so that we can develop the next generation of applications. Okay. Nobody wants just to buy Verizon for open bandwidth. They want to buy to do stuff with that bandwidth. Oh. And we provide one of those things. Well, as I promised earlier, um, I, I took up way too much time with my, with my own questions. But to be sure, these are questions that people have sent me. So um, these, are, well, these were not my own questions. Um, I'd like to ask um, any of you if you have any questions. And again, I'll repeat them for the microphone so we can hear. Dan Horowitz has been chomping at the bit. Uh, point of uh, uh, order, uh, Dan, when I said that the first broadband um, hearing was done by the Internet Caucus 10 years ago, I wasn't around. Um, I was somewhere, but I wasn't here. Uh, Dan Horowitz was with uh, Congressman Rick White's office, who was a founder of the Internet Caucus, and he was planning many of those events. So he really had a lot more vision than I did. So, Dan, your question. <laughs> That's an easy one for you, Mike. Um, can you just repeat? I can't repeat that. Can you repeat that? <laughs> <laughs> and Mike says all the, he wants all the press to court him on this. And I don't know. I mean, the ads that you've been reading, I, I, the ads you've been seeing on, on uh, net neutrality, <laughs> on net neutrality are not all, all no, uh, our ads. It's, it's a stocking horse. We've been, we've been out on the, the hustings. Mike, if you could repeat the question, though. Really. I think the, que the, the question is, is, aren't we just opposed using net neutrality as a stocking horse because we don't like the franchising bills that are going, that are moving through the Congress. Uh, we don't, we, I'm here to talk about net neutrality because we've been, our, I've been talking about net neutrality for longer than there's been a franchising bill. The net neutrality has been an issue, and, I, and from where we sit in the industry, it's funny, I mean, yeah, there are two sides, and, and the one side we hear is the anti-competitive potential, but when I talk to our guys in the industry, the reason they, they shake about this stuff is not just because those, the, the people, people who want to make commercial Deals and want to and want to make sure that the, that there's resources and that Wall Street responds to to investment incentives, but also because our networks have been evolving every step of the way. If if you if I were to ask you or you were to ask me what what services are going to be out there a year from now, how what's the network going to look like? Neither one of us is going to know. So, for example, the movement to peer to peer made a huge difference in the way the internet developed after we began developing our our systems and and as the, as we need more bandwidth, it's a very bandwidth, there are more bandwidth intensive uses. Our guys keep trying to think of ways to ensure that the quality of the experience for the people who continue to, to, to some people are going to only want to get the New York Times on the web, some people want to get video streaming. And we want to make sure that the quality of the experience is suitable so that we keep getting those customers and maintain the quality of service for all those customers. And different business models keep evolving for that. So that's what our concerns have been. And yeah, we don't like the franchising bill a bit, and I could talk about that all day too. <laughs> but that's please, not, please don't. But that's not, that's not what this issue is about. Uh, any other questions? Um, in the back, and then here, and then here. Wow. Okay. The question is um, to <laughs> question. Yeah, um, to brief uh, to brief a member, uh, a congressman, or a senator on which way to vote on a net neutrality bill, and I guess specifically on the Markey bill. Um, how would you get the member to understand it? And I was hoping that this panel would do that. Um, uh, in which way would you vote? Um, uh, in 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 twenty five words or less, I guess. I would say vote yes on the Markey bill because unlike the net neutrality provisions in the bigger COPE Act, it has a, it has a non-discrimination prohibition. And, and, how would, and how would you get him to understand? Uh, you know, uh, if, okay. How would you get him to understand Congressman, that issue? do you like your cable service? Do you like the fact that you can't pick and choose what channels you want on your cable system? Would you like the Internet to look like a cable system? If you don't, then vote for the Markey Amendment. Yeah, that's Gigi's... <laughs> That's exactly right. Well, well, and Gigi, don't, don't steal it. Okay, let me go to Greg and... Yeah. 
get back to the cableizing the internet rhetoric in a minute. Um, it, it works. I'll, it does work, but it's it's well. We'll get back there in a minute. I'm happy to go with you, by the way. If 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 you if, we, if you want to have a longer discussion. <laughs> Um, I think what I'd say is that you're, we're in a great place right now. We're in a regulatory sweet spot, so to speak. And this kind of gets to what Chris said before. We have tons of regulation going on within the network. You've got fiber being built in the wireline network. You've got all kinds of wireless providers and satellite providers putting tons of money in to develop the next broadband Internet service. And you've got tons of innovation going on at the edge of the network. The Googles and the Yahoos and the small indie films companies or whatever it is, the enhanced VoIP providers, the streaming video folks are putting tons of money in innovation, which is, I mean, it's a symbiotic relationship. We can't live without each other. And it's all working right now. So until there's a problem, don't risk what essentially is a good thing that's working with unnecessary regulation. And if the proponents who are coming to you, Mr. Congressman, with nothing more than a Business Week article quoting the head of AT&T are saying this is what you should base all this regulation on, it's not worth taking the risk. I would okay. vote no. 25. Uh, Mike? Well, I, I, I can't stand that i got to agree with the telephone companies. <laughs> <laughs> but, in fact, but, but that's the argument. We've been out there that, that I would say, as I said before, be vigilant. Watch to see if all these anti-competitive things happen, but be understanding, as members would be, having seen efforts at regulation before and the cost of regulation and the cost of imposing regulation on new technologies, be careful that you don't thwart the development that consumers would want. If, as long as, as the market is go, marketplace is going forward and more people are responding more favorably to each new step as, as internet services get deployed and high-speed internet services get enhanced, it shows that consumers are responding favorably and there is no identifiable problem. When, there's an, when there is an identifiable problem, come back and see how, if there's a tailored way to fix it. So that's no on Marky, right? Okay. Um, hey, wait, don't I get to brief the congressman? I thought you were going to. Okay, yes, yes. You get. No, I would say, congressman, do you think the internet's a good thing? Do you think that the fact that people on eBay can make their primary way, of, their primary employment on eBay, is a good thing? Do you think that Google and all the innovation that's happened at the edge of the network is a good thing? Do you want to reelect the internet in some sense? If you do, you'd vote for the Markey Amendment. If you're for discrimination, then you vote against the Markey Amendment. <laughs> Um, that was a fun exercise. Um, right here, question? Yeah, hi. Um, obviously, the House Commerce and Energy Committee felt fairly strongly in a bipartisan sense not to include network neutrality language in their bill. And obviously, the Rules Committee, yes, they decided differently after some, you know, prodding from maybe the sense of Bernard Dell. What do you think, what do, we, what do you take from that that ultimately tomorrow it seems the House will be making it, we'll have a chance, all the warmers will have a chance to vote yay or nay on that. And, and what do you think that means? I mean, you know, it seemed a couple of weeks ago this whole matter was dead, and now it's, you know, lawmakers are going to get the vote for it. What from your distinct position do you take from that? I mean, does this have some momentum that maybe wasn't there two weeks ago? I'll, I'll allow a clarification of the question. Clarification. Dan? Okay, let me, let, me try to, let me try to rephrase the question. Uh, the question is, um, at a certain point, um, I, the, asking the panelists to comment on, at a certain point, the House Commerce Committee did not include uh, certain net neutrality provisions in its bill. Um, but presumably, um, there's been a change for perhaps a variety of different ways by the Rules Committee to actually bring um, the net neutrality provisions to a vote on the floor. Um, perhaps that was pr prodded by um, some other committee's action, perhaps not. Um, but regardless, do you make anything out of this, this change in events that we've seen over the past couple weeks? I think members have been hearing from their constituents. I mean, the Save, Save the Internet.com coalition has 750,000 members, and I'm sure there are, you know, many tens of thousands more that are very, very concerned. 
I think had they not allowed any vote on a net neutrality provision, they just would have been unleashing, <laughs> some of us maybe would almost have preferred that, right? Because to not have that process would really have unleashed a tidal wave. Would it have been better to have a bipartisan amendment up for vote? Obviously, you'd, ra you'd prefer to have that, particularly in a Congress that is, you know, controlled by Republicans, and there are no Republicans on this amendment. But, you know, I, I think there was a concerted decision saying, look, you know, if we deny a vote on this at all, then we're really going to hear it from our constituents. We've been hearing it from them already, so we, so we just absolutely can't say no net neutrality vote at all. Yeah, I just wanted to make one, one point on that. There is actually a net neutrality provision in the Barton Bill. If you're worried about the cableizing the Internet, as Gigi says, that you actually won't be able to get to choose where you want to go on the Internet, that providers are going to make, it, make it, that decision for you, there is a provision in the bill. It says that consumers can go anywhere they want, they can attach any device, they can run any application that is in the Barton Bill. And if, if a network operator goes, goes, goes bad on that, it's hit with a half million dollar fine. So if your concern is let's protect consumers from the, the thing, don't, I don't imagine we would do any of those things because Michael's companies are praying that we do because the consumer would actually just run over to Michael's company and buy the service there. But if your bosses are concerned that we will do those things, you, can, you don't need to support market, you can support what's in the Barton Bill right now. But the, but the problem where the Barton Bill falls short is that there's no non-discrimination principle. So I as a consumer can go to my Vonage service, but if it's being degraded, by a telco or cable system, I've satisfied, right, they've satisfied the COPE Act, but they've not satisfied a non-discrimination principle. So that's where it falls short. So you can have both. You can have broadband deployment and you can have net neutrality. You can have, instead of six companies, you can have 6,006 companies in this ecosystem. And, and that balanced approach to net neutrality is the one that we've urged, and that's why we think the Markey Amendment is the right way to go. Okay, well, I'll go to the next question uh, over there. That is a comment, not a question. Is that a comment, not? I don't, want to, I don't know anything about that particular situation, and I'm happy to learn about it and respond to folks who want to know more about it. I will say that what's in the Markey Amendment goes, I would say, light years beyond the, the problem that's been raised. If there's an issue about networks connecting with other networks, that's, that's, a, that's an issue you can address and that can be dealt with. And, I, I, and if there's a real problem there, there could be hearing, something could be dealt with. The Markey Amendment, it, it goes way beyond um, the problem that, that, that was just raised. And it, it, I don't even know, actually, if it would solve it. Okay. I don't, I don't even think the market maybe even addresses that, that issue. There's a question right over here. Yeah. Well, uh, just let me repeat the question for the for the microphone. Uh, the question was that um, uh, in, in maybe Congress is a little too hot right now um, to to kind of deal with this issue. Um, the COPE Act prohibits the Federal Communications Commission from making a rulemaking, and perhaps a more democratic thing to do would be allow the independent agency, the Federal Communications Commission, rather than the United States Congress. Uh, forgive me uh, for making the point that Congress is 
democratic. It's that's the kind of the point. Yes, Very sir. loud. <laughs> I'm not trying to give a civil civil lecture, but um, I think the, the idea is that wouldn't it be easy for cooler heads to prevail? Just let the FCC do a rulemaking in a more democratic. Um, Right. I think there are two responses to your completely valid concern and question. The first is that the reason why you're hearing volume on our side is that this issue is about our fundamental right to continue to innovate. You have to take as axiomatic the notion that more bandwidth allows us to innovate more, okay? The second answer is the Commission lacks authority to do what you want it to do. The Commission needs authority from Congress to legislate in this area. But, but you still have to give them the authority to do it. That's the problem. So you would rewrite COPE. So you amend COPE in the Under what rule of decision, though? Just give them carte blanche to figure out what the right answer is. I don't know. I don't know, I I don't know that he would. Have I, don't, I don't think any of us. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I would feel comfortable right with that either. Yeah. I think that I think that since I think you make a very good point, which is is this issue has kind of sprung upon Congress, and it's a very serious question, which is we want a lot more broadband. We want a lot of innovation in the network. We want a lot of innovation at the edge of the network. We want consumers to benefit from all of that. That's a very important question. It goes to communications. It goes to speech. It goes to economic development. It goes to our international competitiveness. There's a lot at stake here, and it has been sprung upon very quickly. So this, the right thing to do, I would argue, be get it right in Congress. Take some time. Examine the issue. Try to identify what the problems are. Are there any problems? If there are problems, how do you want to solve them? And then instruct the agency. Give the agency a, a clear direction on where to go. I think that would be actually a good approach for Congress to take. And on the notion of, just on the notion of FCC authority, uh, you know, Chairman Copps, and, um, and Chairman Copps and uh, I think Chairman Martin recently. Chairman oh, I'm sorry, Martin. Commissioner Copps. Wishful thinking. <laughs> Personal, not company. Um, uh, Commissioner Copps. I thought you liked it. Commissioner Copps and, um, and Chairman Martin have both said recently they think they have all the authority they need to prevent network operators from um, from going about things or going or, or doing uh, behaving in a nefarious way against applications providers. But, but Greg's company has to take a little bit of the blame for the hot and heavy and the rush, rush, rush because they want national franchise authority. That, to them, is the golden carrot. And, and that's why you're seeing a rush here. <clears throat> I think you're absolutely right. This is an issue that needs consideration and a lot of education. It's, it's taken the pro-net neutrality forces a long time, I would say six, seven months, to get to the point where you know, members are really starting to understand it. I think we need a little bit more time, but there's this desire to get the national video franchise. In my mind, there's no way a national video franchise bill should go without enforceable net neutrality. And we, we are actually supportive on the, on the national video franchise. But to the extent that some people are saying, oh, let the national video franchise go, and we'll do net neutrality later. Yeah, and I've got a, you know, a patch of land in Arizona and desert I want to sell, sell you. So it's just one can't go without the other. <clears throat> Dan, if you could speak up a little bit, please. Thanks. Didn't he put out a comments um, on this issue like four years ago? Yeah, what we did. And what we did was establish some very, very high level principles. But this was several years ago. And all really Gigi and I are saying is let's update that with a fifth non discrimination principle. Then we feel like openness and innovation would, would grow on the net. But the four principles that you're referring to. But you had the power to do that. It was a policy statement. It was a simple expression. It was an aspirational, we hope that the market goes in this direction. It lacked a legal grounding. It was, a, as I said, an aspirational goal. But you want more than the fifth policy. No, we want the fifth principle. And it should say, if you're a network operator, you may not discriminate on the basis of source or ownership. It's as simple as that. In a merger condition that only applies to two companies in this market. Yes, but then it reinforced the thought and the policy from one chairman to the next, didn't it? It did. 
Okay. It did. And that's one of the few areas of consistency, I think, between administrations. <laughs> It's sort of watching it like this. It's watching it with one eye closed because it's only got its eye on the people that are coming to them as a merger partner. So that's not right. This is coming to you. Admittedly, someone who lobbied on that issue, I lobbied Chris on this issue. And what you said back then was there's no there there. There's no harm. Madison never happened and stopped. But there's nothing there. And so the thing to keep in mind is that that was before the major telco CEOs said we're going to impose this two tiered internet and these discriminatory charges on websites. Let me let me just let me just address the issue of well why don't we wait and see if bad things happen and and you know I, I'm sorry I got to take a pot shot once again at the cable industry because you know yes this was some years ago but you you know <clears throat> one of your members banned virtual private networks another one of your members limited streaming video to 10 minutes so you guys don't exactly have clean hands but 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 here's what I fear will happen if you just take the let's wait and see approach. This is a letter from the National Telecommunications Cooperative Association. And they fear that if there's net neutrality regulations, that vital resources which would have been spent on network upgrades could be diverted to re-engineering networks to meet non-discriminatory requirements. And that's what you're going to hear. If you wait and see, people will build their networks to be discriminatory. And that's what Cisco is selling. That's what Alcatel is selling. You wait. You discriminate, all of a sudden everybody gets up in arms, and guess what the, and guess what the companies are going to say to you? Oh my God, we just spent millions and billions of dollars to build these discriminatory networks, and now you're telling us we have to you know, re-engineer them to be non-discriminatory? You know, what, what, what Gigi well, calls let me, let me discrimination, let me just... Uh, the and then to Mike. Okay, sure. Um, what Gigi calls discrimination, we would call differentiation. If there are, <laughs> and what I mean by that is, if there are five or six content providers out there, they all want different things from us. Some people might want security. Some people might want bandwidth. Some people might want to uh, sign up with a joint marketing agreement. Some people might want to pay on a per download basis. They all want to do different things. And what, the, what Gigi says, a non-discrimination principle says that we can't do what every other company in the marketplace does. We can't customize our contracts. We want to sell to everybody. When you're, when you're running a network, you don't make money negotiating exclusive deals. You make money selling to everyone who wants to buy capacity from you, because that's the only way Verizon makes money. We sell capacity. We don't sell anything else. Um, so we want to sell to as many people as possible. We just want to be able to structure our contracts in a way that our customers want. And different customers want different contracts. The, the, the non-discrimination provision which Gigi has and which Chris is advocating would literally subject us to liability for having a different, for having a different contractual agreement with Viacom than with Disney than with Hallmark. Now, why would you do that? What, and how does that incent us to build the new functions to enter that market? I think well, no, it, um, Mike okay. got the pot shot, so I'm going to let him respond. Well, let me just respond to the pot shot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, virtual private, I love you, virtual Mike. private networks. You know what virtual private networks are? That's when it's, if you, now we call it now we use Citrix or whatever it is to get into our to get into our uh, uh, email and our and our computers at the office from home using a home computer. And there were some of the early in the earliest days of cable operators' internet service agreements with customers that said, and you know, you can't use a virtual private network on this, on, on, on the network, because somebody thought, I don't know if it was ever enforced, but somebody thought this could be a problem here. And, and it was a problem, I had a regulatory guy for the brunt of that, because people came in and said, you see, they're discriminating against virtual private networks. We tried to figure out why we would do that. But I went down and I talked to some of the technical guys to figure out why did this happen? Is this some sort of business judgment? We're trying to make money somewhere else on this? Maybe somebody was, but what, what I found out was that somebody put that in there, in some of the agreements at least, because they figured out that at that time, to do a virtual private network, you, you needed a stat something called a static IP address. Uh, as, oppo as, a, as opposed to what we normally provided people, and the quality of service would, would not work with VPNs. We'd have all kinds of problems. Somebody put that in the agreement for that reason. This is a good example. I don't know whether that was a necessary agreement or not a necessary agreement. I don't know if it had some uh, potential discriminatory impact or not, but it was an example of our industry trying to build and grow a new business that was good for our customers and trying to figure out how it works technologically. This is still very, very new technology and it's evolving all the time. So for every, 
example like virtual private networks that are thrown out as, as if it's something we're doing for some sinister reason, uh, you know, I'm, I have to because I'm the one who's going to have to answer these things, go down and find out, is that why we're doing it or is there some good technological reason? And until you are quite certain or even have a good, a, a good base for suspicion that there's something sinister going on and there's some market failure here, our guys get apoplectic about the idea that they can't continue to think about how best to build this network to make it work for customers without some regulatory overlay that says you can't do this and you can't do that. Okay. One la uh, we have room for one last question, so please make it good. No pressure. <laughs> Good question. Good job. Um, just to repeat really quickly. <laughs> uh, just repeat quickly for the cameras. Um, if if you create a, a company on the web and um, you you don't have to pay Verizon or Comcast in most cases to deliver it um, unless you're using them as a provider to that, um, you get the same service from end to end to customer, um, regardless of who you are. Um, but if you um, if you get to a regime where you have to pay extra for the highest tier of service to get to that potential customer, um, haven't we violated something here? Who gets to go first, Greg or me? It sounds like that's directed to Greg. Danny, I, I think that's a great question, and I think just the opposite is true. Um, if you were going to start your own search engine tomorrow, if you came up with some fabulous way to compete with Google, you couldn't provide the same quality of service they do. As, as Chris said, Google spends hundreds of millions of dollars setting up server farms and connecting right onto the backbone so the consumers who access Google can have a much better experience than you could ever provide starting your own company. Google also will cache, which means they will place their content um, in regions around the country so that when you actually access, when you access Google, um, you can go to a local server and get content much faster. Danny's search engine probably couldn't afford to do that. Google has other ways of just spending lots of money to provide a quality of service that you couldn't do if you started this on your own. One thing you might be able to do to compete with Google is you might be able to do, reach a commercial agreement with a network operator where you could actually provide a quality of service that's somewhere close to what the others can do, spending hundreds of millions of dollars on server farms and caching and other things. And I think, frankly, that's one of the main reasons why the Googles of the world are spending so much money on net neutrality. I mean, these are companies, Microsoft, I guess, is one example, that haven't always cared about garage companies, let's say. But I think it's fair to say that they're doing what most companies do in the public policy arena, which is they're legislating to some degree to achieve business goals. And one way to achieve a business goal is to make sure that Danny's website, Danny's search engine, cannot reach that same level of quality of service as Google. And one way you would do that is through agreement with a commercial operator. Okay. Um, this, this, Chris? this is an argument that I, I'm going to try to stay calm about this because it's a little hard for us to be lectured about what sort of entrepreneurial companies Act, how they act on the internet. My company was started in a basement in London. If we got into a world of a two-tiered internet, think about what that would mean for a small company who's trying to reach a global audience, a global audience of internet users. This is a picture of the internet, okay? This little bit down here is AOL, okay? If that company in the center in London wants to offer this service to everybody on the internet, what does that mean? That means deals with every incumbent where we land traffic in India, in China, in America. You break the end-to-end -end principle that the Internet was built on when you talk about a two-tiered Internet, and you create barriers to entry into the market for things like free phone service that shouldn't exist. But you only create a barrier to entry if people can't go to www.dannyswebsite.com. Because once a consumer can buy a Verizon product, at 5 megabits or 15, 15 megabits and 30 megabits and go to your website at the speed they purchase and they are guaranteed to be able to get to your website and they don't have to pay extra to get there and you don't have to pay extra for them to get there, then where, as, long as, you, as long as you maintain that world, 
which is the world we live in today and what the House bill addresses without the Markey Amendment, then but, but here's uh, a, here's uh, a, 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 a difference between the world we live in today and the world that Greg imagines, okay, and his company imagines. It's eBay's or Skype's choice whether they want to purchase, you know, ca caching services. It's um, new website. But there's no legal, uh, there's no legal prohibition on us from doing that today, as far as I know, and, we, and we're not. Um, well, that SBC has S Yahoo. They have a portal. For example, I don't. You, if you want to call that, up. SBC has w with Yahoo the great promoter of net neutrality, and we have actually MSN, um, where they they have a it's it's a joint marketing agreement actually, where if you sign up with Verizon or you sign up with AT and T, you can choose for your portal to be Yahoo, and you can go right to Yahoo, or you can choose MSN. So there are things like that. But on the notion of the, exclu the exclusive content provider, the exclusive financial institution, I mean, technically we could do that today. It would be commercially suicidal to do that because we wouldn't really make money if we started selling, you know, if we're, we're not spending billions of dollars on a network, essentially, to create all this new functionality, to create all this new ability to provide security and provide, and provide reliability and provide connectivity and provide privacy so we can sell to one person in each area. Okay, we um, want to be able to sell to everybody. That's the investment we're making, is to do that. And, and I think Mike gets the last word. Well, I, uh, I don't know if this is the last word, but the world as we, as we know it today, there's an assumption here sometimes that without, it, without any fast lanes, without any differentiation of how Internet content gets to the home, there's every, everybody survives just fine, and the world is great, and consumers have a great experience from it. But these things don't just happen of their own. Without a, without a fast lane, new services that devour a lot of bandwidth begin to begin to crowd the, the bandwidth that's available to the home and grab for it. Peer-to-peer, -peer, I think I mentioned that before, has a way of gobbling up available uh, available bandwidth and making it very difficult for for some of the video streaming services or, or music services or other high uh, intensive bandwidth services to be provided at the same quality that consumers want it to be there, be at. If people can just keep putting stuff out on the internet with no, with no concern about efficiency of bandwidth use, uh, the internet gets clogged. It's a technological problem as well as an economic problem. You can't just, all, a lot of this discussion assumes like, well, assume a network and then let's see how we, how we, can, how we should regulate it. Okay. The network doesn't build itself. It's got to be adapted to the uses that are out there. Okay, that's the last word. Um, I want to thank, I don't envy you any of you, your tasks for talking to your members, but good luck and thank you for your attention.